Uh, this time, uh, the lecture will be a uh, tour of various results in numerical relativity, um, mostly geared towards gravitational waves, but not completely. I should say this time around, I really do not see the chat window. So, um, Ajith, please interrupt me whenever there's something important uh, going on in the chat window. Um, let me start with something I haven't mentioned at all, and uh, that's the distinction between event horizon and apparent horizon. Uh, this is a movie of the event horizon of two black holes uh, merging. And the interesting feature that shows up here is that the event horizon is developing these cusps um, moving from one black hole towards the other one. Uh, the event horizon is defined in a rather um, impractical way for numerical simulations. It is defined as that part of the uh, space-time, which is as the boundary of that part of the space-time, which is no longer in, in causal contact with future non-infinity. So from within the event horizon, there are causal curves that reach uh, infinity. There are light rays that can escape the black hole and make it all the way out. From, the, from outside the event horizon, there are light rays you could, that connect you with infinity, so you can have information propagation and possibly and possibly uh, escape from, from the region to, to far away distances, whereas inside the event horizon, um, no light ray and therefore also no matter can escape to large distances. Um, and this causes these cusps here towards the middle, um, because if you are between the two black holes, you're not only um, feeling uh, gravitational forces of the one black hole closer to you, but you also anticipate the other black hole coming closer. And uh, so if you're between, you actually need to escape the gravity of both black holes, which is harder to do. And therefore there's a bigger region of space time already inside the event horizon. Whereas on the outside, well, the second black hole is still fairly far away and it's easier to escape. That's such a generic feature that event horizons have these cusps. Uh, I mentioned already they are unpleasant and impractical for numerical relativity because in order to compute the event horizon, to decide whether a point is inside or outside, you need to know the future. You need to know what's going to happen later on in your space time um, for that. In contrast, uh, the thing called apparent horizons in numerical relativity those are objects that can be computed from just data at the current time. Here's a movie that shows both the event horizon again in black and the apparent horizons as, as the blue spheres. Um, apparent horizons are defined as surfaces where if you um, anywhere on the surface generate an outward going light pulse, um, travels out speed of light or null geodesics, and to follow this light pulse for a certain amount of time, for a certain amount of, of proper affine parameter, then for apparent horizons, the area of the wavefront is constant. Usually in flat space, if you start with a sphere, you shoot light rays to larger radius, the width, the, you get a bigger sphere with bigger bigger area, for apparent horizons, the area is constant. If you're even deeper inside a black hole, the area of the outgoing light front is actually decreasing. There are theorems that apparent horizons are always inside event horizons. Um, as you can see in this particular image, uh, sometimes they're not even close, um, but at very early times, um, in stationary situations, apparent horizons and event horizons agree. And at very late times, after the merge of the two black holes, um, you will see that, uh, again, the 
parental voice and the mental voice and relate free with each other. Let me stop this movie yet again. One other difference between a parent horizons and event horizons is that event horizons are smooth surfaces. And so uh, they have a cusp, but they always behave continuously. Whereas a parent horizons can appear and disappear discontinuously. Like here at this particular instance, you have the green common apparent horizon just appearing circum around the two inner apparent horizons of each individual black hole. And of course, even the green common apparent horizon is still inside the event horizon. So far, everything is still highly distorted. As I go forward in time, the green event hor apparent horizon is approaching the event horizon as it must for uh, the late time stationary behavior of the now black hole at quiescence. One more image of the same diagram, um, this time a space time, the time diagram. The um, white square indicates two of the spatial dimensions and time is going up. We start down here with two individual event horizons, uh, two components of the event horizons and going up, they eventually join up in this famous pair of pants picture. The white lines that are coming in here, those are null geodesics, very special ones. Uh, null geodesics that are joining the event horizon in the singularity here in this cusp at the seam of the pair of pants and uh, joining and enlarging the area of the event horizons. As you may know from, from your GR lecture, new, new geodesics can enter the event horizon, but none can leave them. And the one thing that surprised me in this particular uh, piece of work is that I had always thought these uh, new null geodesics just coming from large distances being shot at very precise angles to hit the pair of the seam of the, of the pair of pants. Um, however, if you look closely, you also have some of these geodesics like this one here that starts close to one of the black holes just outside uh, the individual event horizon. And just it is about to get away, about to escape to infinity, um, it feels the additional attractive force of the second black hole coming ever closer. And that way is turning around and then coming back here and joining uh, the seam of the pair of pants and the other event. So cool things going on. Uh, now that we switch over and uh, talk about the, the primary topic of this talk, and these are uh, the merging of, of two black holes. And let me just start with the uh, a version of the usual diagram that's always being made to explain what's going on. Um, we're starting with the inspire of two black holes, uh, still at fairly large separation. Um, they come closer and closer until eventually they merge and they um, go to into ring down. In this process, the frequency tends to monotonically increasing, certainly during the inspiral, but also from merger to ring down, the frequency is still increasing. And so I'm, I'm loosely putting down the frequency here as uh, the variable that tracks the entire process. Uh, Harald, there is a question from Apratim. Okay. Uh, hi, sorry, a quick question regarding the simulation that you showed uh, for the event horizon. I just want to, like, as you mentioned that it, it's impossible to track uh, the event horizon at, 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 at every instant of time. So is it some kind of post-processing that you did for the simulation or is it like how did you manage to do that simulation of the event horizon? That's an excellent question. And let's just, I don't have a useful picture here, so let's just explain it um, in, in words only. The way you do it is you first compute the entire space-time. So you run your numerical relativity simulation. That also means if you do apparent black hole tracking, um, you can't use the event horizon because you don't know it yet. We're going to use the apparent horizons. And you store the space time volume of the entire simulation. Then it's not plotted here, but if you go forward in time, 
not shoot at six that are slightly away from the event horizon are deviating from it exponentially as you go forward in time. If you're outside, uh, they will deviate exponentially towards larger radius and eventually uh, escape to null infinity. If you're inside, again, multiple disks will deviate exponentially and fall towards the singularity. So the trick now is that you start at very late times at this red circle up here. You initiate a ring of multiple disks, essentially on the red circle on the append horizon. This is already close to the event horizon and you shoot this null geodesics backwards in time. So some of them will just track the event horizon all the way back. Others actually happen to be these white ones that initially are on the event horizon, but then eventually leave the event horizon and are escaping to it. Or like this one here, escape the event horizon, but still stay in the vicinity of, of one of the individual records. Okay, so uh, large separation, small separation, merge ring down. And at large separation, um, the primary tools for modeling uh, this process are post Newtonian theory and more recently also post Minkowski theory and also the effective one body theory, which is a, a repackaging of hybrid. You end up with these fairly lengthy looking perturbative expansions in V over C. I think we have Bala Ila on the call. He's one of the world experts in, in doing this type of thing. In contrast, on the opposite side of things, in, in the ring down phase, one can do, uh, again, analytical perturbation theory, but this time uh, perturbations around the final quiescent black hole. And that way, for instance, come up with the frequency of, of various ring down modes as a function of the black hole, final black hole spin. Um, in the middle is numerical relativity. Uh, as already pointed out two days ago, uh, the tool we have to deal with numerical general relativity in the face of a highly nonlinear and dynamic behavior uh, around the time of merger the last orbits before, merger, and afterwards. Also shown on this diagram as a second axis is the mass ratio, where on the top I have equal masses, and down here I put 10 to the minus six as uh, the biggest relevant mass ratio that comes up in LISA, but you could view this as going down all the way to zero. Um, at small mass ratios, there's another perturbation theory one can do, and this is one can perturb in the mass of the small body that orbits around a much bigger primary body. And so there's all these different tools available for computing, uh, uh, dealing with the two body problem in various regimes. And in order to compute the waveform templates for LIGO, all of these is being utilized and combined together. Of course, there's more degrees of freedom than mass ratio and frequency. There's also additional uh, variables like open eccentricity, black hole spins, uh, or any meta effects or non GR effects you might think of. So the picture is more complicated still. Uh, the importance of numerical relativity in this whole process is twofold. For one, it's the only process that actually connects the in spiral phase with the ring down phase, going from left to right. I've indicated here extremely schematically in color coding the uh, applicability of the various regimes. And for two, the region that is presently covered by numerical relativity also happens to be the region where uh, the LIGO black holes, the parameters of the LIGO black holes uh, are found. They are almost all of them close to equal masses. And they are all of most of them at so high mass ratio, uh, so high total mass, that uh, the late in spiral, the merger, and the ring down is visible by LIGO. So, what's now the role of NR in this whole game and, and towards uh, gravitational waves? Um, the obvious thing is it needs to supply the solution of general relativity 
for the late in spiral and merger. Um, it also needs to provide error estimates of, of how good its solution actually is. And that way also determine the region of validity of the various perturbative uh, methods that are being used. Um, the old term become less accurate as you push them towards the boundary of the region of validity. And so one of the big uh, points and questions is uh, where to best switch over from one to the other. This is quite important because as of today, the accuracy needed is so high that all the results of the perturbation theory are actually needed for the science. You can't use the next higher order of post-Newtonian theory to get an error estimate on how good post-Newtonian theory is because we don't have it. And the ones we have, we actually need to get as accurate templates as possible. Um, and in addition, uh, numerical relativity should also cover uh, all objects that are floating around and that we can think of, the black holes I'm talking about, uh, the neutron stars that uh, Ian Hawke has been talking about, but also ex exotic objects and alternative theory eventually, even if presently very little work has been done on this front. And this is indeed a movie. Ha, huh, I had forgotten about that. Um, this is one of the movies of uh, accompanying the first gravitational wave detection, the two black holes orbiting about each other with almost equal masses and the visualization of the emitted gravitational waves and uh, very nice public friendly uh, uh, coloring. What's shown here is the Newman Penrose scale up Psi 4 and at the end of the day you have the uh, remnant black hole sitting there. Okay, let's switch over and, and talk about numerical relativity and uh, just a recap of the things I've talked already about two days ago. We take the full space time and we cut it into space like hypersurfaces, which we are labeling by a continuous time parameter little t. Uh, the full space time Einstein equations split into space like and time like quantities you end up with a set of evolution equations for the induced metric and the extrinsic curvature, and you end up with a set of constraints for the same quantities. The same structure, by the way, as Maxwell's equations, where you can view the curl equations as the evolution equations, what they are, and where you could view the divergence equations, here written down in vacuum, as the constraints. So, as in GR, Maxwell's equations as well, you could in principle start with any vectors E and B and evolve the curl equations, but to make physical sense, you must make sure that your vector fields E and B satisfy the divergence equations. Um, there was a question quite a, quite a bit earlier about the difference in black hole perturbation theory and, and black hole expansions and post-Newtonian theory. Uh, the difference is essentially what you consider to be the small parameter. In uh, black hole perturbation theory, the small parameter is uh, the velocity of the uh, post Newtonian theory. The small parameter is the velocity of the black holes. And that induces certain features on the stress energy tensor. And that then is being solved for in, uh, eventually. Whereas in black hole perturbation theory, um, uh, we basically directly assume that the metric is uh, Kerr metric plus a small perturbation. So it's a different uh, expansion parameter and that leads to very different techniques as you go on and, and go through the analytical work. Um, so this slide makes everything look nice. Why is it difficult? Well, we've talked about this. The ADM equations are ill posed, and we've spent all of Monday rewriting them as hyperbolic systems. Constraints are difficult to preserve. We need to choose coordinates for a space time we don't know yet. I didn't mention so far much the singularities inside the black holes, with singularities being something that computers don't like at all. 
if you run into a zero by zero and infinity by infinity, uh, the computer will happily give you a none and stop working. Um, so those need to be de dealt with one way or the other. And I also didn't really emphasize much yet uh, the numerical challenges that when all is said and done, you end up not with uh, five variables like for one scalar field equation in, in first order form, but you're somewhere between 20 and 50 variables um, that you all have to evolve together. Um, I didn't even write down the right hand sides of these evolution equations. I usually just put a, a few uh, points there. Uh, they're very complicated and uh, will cost you order 10,000 floating point operations for each grid point for each time step. And then one also has to deal with numerical with different length scales and very high accuracy requirements. Adding a little bit more about the early work here. Uh, this is the very first paper about black holes, um, the two-body problem in geometrical dynamics on 64. Um, I've put up the abstract because it tweets so nicely. The numerical calculations were carried out on an IBM 7090 electronic computer. The parameters were blah, 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 uh, yielding a 51 by 151 mesh. The calculation of all unknown functions, including a great number of input-output operations and some built-in checking procedures, took approximately four minutes per time step. And we ran for 50 time, step, 50 time steps, when the total elapsed time was approximately 1.8. Moving forward 30 I, I, years. There is one question on the chat box. Question. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so the event horizon, in principle, the, the data needed for the event horizon, since it's always outside the apparent horizons, is available. Um, but usually one doesn't store the volume data to compute it. Um, so pretty much for any simulation done, everybody's computing apparent horizons but virtually never event horizons are being computed. Um, there may be only about three or five or so binary black hole simulations so far where a good quality event horizon has been computed. Um, you will usually know very quickly because whenever you hear a talk and somebody actually shows an event horizon, that person will point out very clearly that it is an event horizon because it's so much work to compute. And if nothing is said and micro relativists use the word horizon, it's almost always, virtually always the apparent horizon. Moving forward, from by 30 years uh, towards the end of the 90s, uh, this is the uh, one of the big outcome papers of the binary black hole grand challenge, where the final result was you start with a black hole around z equals zero, and as you propagate forward in time by 60 time units, uh, the black holes moves the black hole moves with roughly 10% of the speed of light and it has moved from position zero to position six by about yeah, six Schwarzschild radii in this particular case. At that point, the simulation crashed. So not really that successful just yet. And then in 2005, uh, things really took off. First with the seminal paper by Franz Pretorius setting out uh, the general harmonic scheme and then later followed by the two papers from Brownsville and Goddard, Campanelli et al., uh, Carlos Dusto, Pietro Maronetti, and Yusuf Slochova, and John Baker et al., um, who were uh, the two groups uh, independently discovering uh, the moving puncture approach. The first simulations were utterly amazing and impressive. 
Um, here is the result of Pretorius's first paper. Um, the black curve starting, uh, the, the green curve starting here is a low resolution uh, trajectory of one of the two black holes. It goes around for one orbit and one eighth of an orbit, and then a common horizon is detected and the black holes have merged. As Franz goes to higher and higher resolution, the green orbit becomes the blue and then the black. So it differs quite widely from the low resolution run, but medium and high resolution are very closely together, only doing about three quarters of an orbit. And then uh, the merger happens. Here's the waveform extracted at uh, a few different extraction radius, 25, 50, 75, and 100. And if you take this waveform at different uh, radii and you time translate them appropriately, um, then you see all the features are lining up. And so we actually have a traveling gravitational wave leaving the system. Also, of course, right here, as you go from 25 to 100, if you look at the, map, at the amplitudes, um, the amplitudes are decreasing quite substantially because of uh, the low accuracy of these first simulations. Um, and Franz was doing the simulations, he was still in Canada, uh, or he was just moving from Canada, from Edmonton back to California. And uh, around that time, he was actually probably the biggest new computing time user in, in Canada. A few years later, I took over that role for a brief period of time. Once things worked, uh, progress was quite quickly. So here's again, uh, Francis' first waveform uh, and the, the Bacon Campanelli waveforms, they obviously look similar because all of them are supposed to be from Egonas non spinning merger. And very quickly, people figured out how to do somewhat longer simulations. Here, for instance, is a simulation from the Goddard group a year later, um, already doing something like five orbits or so, which was totally unheard of at the time, and everybody was totally astonished. Uh, the Harald, result... there is a question from Surendra. I thought I had addressed this already. Oh, sorry, he has a hand up. I mean, oh, okay, good. Uh, Go ahead. Hi, so while I was asking that question, what I actually meant is uh, supposing there is some information that is actually escaping from the apparent horizon, like maybe uh, like during the uh, merger of a binding neutron star, you're looking at some exactor that is actually living out your uh, system. So like information like that, is it taken care that the event horizon, that the information cannot actually escape the apparent horizon because there is an event horizon beyond it? Uh, so essentially what I'm trying to say is that it is automatically taken care because of the way the geodesics uh, evolve in time. So Am I understanding correctly? So that's what I wanted. To yes, you are understanding correctly. So, well, there's a few different aspects to this question. Number one is the ejector and neutron star simulations. They all come from parts of the neutron star that are outside the event horizon. So it's it's the outer layers at the far side of the neutron of the binary neutron stars that form the ejector, and they are never inside any event or apparent horizon. So so those things are fine. Not only that, I mean, there was this recent paper where they were actually trying to say uh, why uh, salt a cold space black hole perturbation theory can be extended till the merger. So there was this paper which was looking at some non-linearities. Uh, and they say that most of the non-linearities actually go inside the apparent horizon. So that time it was not. Uh, so when you actually were explaining this, I got a doubt that, uh, uh, I mean, so it's automatically taken care that uh, even if some uh, non-linear is actually escaping the apparent horizon, but since they're inside the event horizon, they will eventually again come back into the uh, inside the apparent horizon. So that's what happens, right? The, the second storyline is the um, causality of the space-time, exactly what you just mentioned, mm -hmm. that if you are in the region between apparent and event horizon, let me go back to and hopefully the right thing. If you're in the region between apparent and event horizon, 
like here, you can, for a short period of time, move further away from the apparent horizon. Uh, so locally in time, you can, it appears you can escape from the apparent horizon, uh, especially in formation propagation at the speed of light. But on, on global long-term times, um, uh, the light comb and the causality is determined by the event horizon. So whatever happens here will eventually have to be turning around and fall into uh, one of the singularities. And so this is true mathematically as long as cosmic censorship holds, which we have all indications that it is. And it is also satisfied in all codes as far as we can tell on the numerical level. Okay, thank you, that answers. What already came out of these early simulations is that the merger of two black holes looks very, very simple. It's a continuous transition from in spiral to ring down. And it's the simplicity that you don't have any chaotic features or long-lived non-linear behavior. That is one of the reasons why simulating black holes is actually uh, possible and making waveform templates with the high quality we have is possible. Very early on, uh, also, black hole spins were explored in, in quite a bit of detail. And so if you have an asymmetric collision of two black holes, the gravitational wave emission will also be asymmetric. And with asymmetric gravitational wave emission, you will also get asymmetric uh, linear momentum emission, and therefore a remnant that has a linear momentum in the opposite direction of the predominant gravitational wave linear momentum emission. For non-spinning black holes, like shown here on the left-hand side as a function of mass ratio, uh, these kicks are fairly modest, about 150 kilometers max. However, for spinning black holes, uh, you can reach velocities up to about 5,000 kilometers per second for the remnant black hole. I'm showing here one plot of um, uh, two black holes orbiting about each other with both spins in the equatorial planes, large spins, anti-aligned with each other. And the different curves here, what they vary is the initial direction within the equatorial plane of the, in, in which the spins are pointing. And with this initial direction uh, comes this characteristic bobbing up and down of the black holes as, as you have the orbits. And ultimately, when the black holes are merging, uh, this sinusoidal up and down motion is cut off and whatever speed is left at this particular point roughly corresponds to the speed of the remnant black hole. So for the blue case, for instance, they are, uh, the remnant black hole is traveling towards minus C with quite high speed. Um, if you change the spin directions initially a little bit, you might get something close to zero. If you change the spin direction somewhat more, you can get a spin, uh, the remnant black hole moving up because it was truncated, uh, the red motion was truncated in a different point along its up and down motion uh, than the blue curve. Overall, the history of, of uh, numerical relativity is quite complicated um, with a lot of different things happening. Um, here's an attempt to, to cover the first 50 years. Um, the gray stuff here is various analytical developments. We talked about the ADM formulation. Um, we talked about uh, hyperbolicity, where Bona Masso was very important, and, and Jimmy York. Um, puncture data, initial data is covered in 97 and in 99 in a few different cases. Uh, blue are various numerical results uh, that I, I showed the two wormholes. Um, somewhere must be the first grand challenge calculation. Here it is. And then in 2005, 2006, uh, the big breakthroughs with simulations actually working. And in what follows, I'm, recover I'm talking about a lot of results uh, subsequently. Um, by now, there are two primary ways of solving numerical relativity for binary black holes. 
And as it happens, they are nearly completely orthogonal to each other. I talked about the evolution equations, um, the BSSN equations on the one side and the generalized harmonic equations on the other side with constraint damping as indicated here with this red term. However, the two schemes also use very different initial data procedures. On the left side, one uses puncture initial data, which does initial data on a hypersurface going from uh, one asymptotically flat end through the black hole, uh, through einstein rosen bridges to, to second asymptotically flat ends in the middle. Uh, this is necessary because the moving puncture evolutions actually need a complete R3, initial data covering a complete R3 manifold all the way to the singularities, um, which are then taken care of during the evolution. On the other side, uh, we on the SXX side uh, use initial data that starts again at, at null infinity, even if I have offset it here slightly, I apologize. Uh, sorry, it starts at space-like infinity and is truncated somewhat inside the apparent horizon. Um, however, we are using more, put more effort into making this initial data approximately time independent. It's quasi equilibrium initial data. And that is necessary in order to launch and start the generalized harmonic evolutions without uh, strong gradients and, and, and transients. It also allows to do spins bigger than 0.9, up to 0.999 uh, currently. So initial data is different, evolution equations are different, gauge conditions are also different. I haven't mentioned this much. The outer boundary conditions are different. Um, and the final difference codes uh, using BSSN, outer boundary conditions are typically quite simplistic. Uh, whereas in generalized harmonic, I'll get to that in a minute, because of the good understanding of the mathematical structure of wave equations, uh, we can use uh, constraint preserving and minimally reflective outer boundary conditions. And finally, the finer differences are also, uh, the numerical methods are also different. Uh, finer differences, much more sophisticated though than what I had described yesterday and multi-domain spectral methods. So two completely different approaches and I will show later a lot that the results are actually consistent with each other. And that consistency is very important in uh, understanding and making sure we actually have correct solutions. I have a few slides about the spec code. Um, uh, uh, mostly to, to show you a few more images and also to, to enforce that numerical relativity codes are big things. So SPEC is developed by the Simulation Extreme Spacetime Collaborations and uh, the code is about six, seven hundred thousand lines long and has been, has seen contributions by some 50 people or so over the last 20 years. Uh, this slide I already had mentioned yesterday in, in, in great detail. The idea of spectral methods is you expand your solution in terms of some basis functions. And if you do this correctly, you will find exponential convergence. Uh, basis functions work best if the domain in which you're expanding is simple enough to, to develop the theory of basis functions. So what we do in spec is we have uh, spherical shells near each black hole, like shown here. We have cylinders and blocks at intermediate distances, like shown here, uh, cut in half. And at large distances, we have more spherical shells. Um, and so this, this allows us to actually excise black hole singularities uh, which are sitting inside the innermost spherical shell, which is adapted to the apparent horizon. It allows us to adapt resolution as we need. We, we do vary resolution in each uh, element uh, individually, and it also allows parallelization. All of this might sound quite similar to discontinuous Galerkin. Um, one difference to discontinuous Galerkin is that in spec we use comparatively few domains, about a hundred or so only, and push the expansion order very high to about 30 or so in each dimension. Uh, that's very efficient. However, it limits 
parallelizability a lot <coughs> um, because we can only parallelize to about 100 cores or so, one per uh, domain. Uh, discontinuous Galerkin, the idea is to have a lot more smaller elements uh, that can be distributed a lot more widely on processors. Also, we have discovered over the years that this plot, as elegant as it might seem, with spheres and cylinders and cubes and more cylinders and overlap and touching and whatnot, is actually extremely difficult to maintain numerically because there's so many different uh, basis functions floating around and so many different uh, types of boundary conditions to take care of at internal boundaries. Discontinuous Galerkin, everything is going to become uh, just cubes, uh, cubes that are touching each other. And so there's one scheme that works everywhere and uh, parallelization is much easier because each cube will have the same work per grid point not like here with the spheres uh, that have a different grid point load than uh, the other domains. Uh, Harold, uh, I presume had a question on the initial data. Okay. Um, not easily. Uh, I, I, not easily. I guess, Abra team, uh, let's get in touch after the lecture. Perhaps you can ask a question afterwards when I have more time. Um, uh, sure, I can, but uh, can you just explain just for the, like, I, I, I know about the puncture initial data, just uh, the quasi equilibrium ex uh, excitation, like, and also, like, uh, excision, and also the fact that uh, you mentioned, and we know that for the spec code, you can handle, um, uh, uh, like the, the parameter space that you can handle is much more than for the finer difference. Uh, what are the advantages that you can get on, on the finer difference part of the code? Or find the, the okay. finer difference. Uh, I, than, I, I take all my, I can't do this back and, and thank you for your question. Uh, because as it turns out, this is on the next slide. Um, so, the next slide is, is, is the, the big picture of, of solving the constraints again. Uh, you have the Hamiltonian momentum constraint in the top left corner. The trick is to decompose. You write the spatial metric as a conformal factor times a conformal spatial metric to get an elliptic equation for the conformal factor. You decompose the extrinsic curvature and you get elliptic equations for some vector potential. So far, so good. Now, what in extremely simply language, what puncture data does is, it uses analytic solutions for this V equation, and then you're only left over with the Psi equation. Uh, the analytic solutions are only very good, well, they're, they're, they're always analytic solutions, no, no question there, uh, but the assumptions that go into them do not hold for black holes with very high spin. And what matters is, is the conformal flatness approximation. If you do conformal flatness approximations, um, it turns out curved black holes are not conformally flat. So you, you are making a, a mistake there. And the deformation from conformal flatness becomes ever more pronounced at high spins. And that is why with conformal flatness, you only get up to spins of about 0.9. This is true for puncture data. But it's also true for uh, uh, the quasi-equilibrium data that uh, uh, we are, are using in, in SXX that I was developing during my PhD thesis. In quasi-equilibrium data, you keep all four momentum, all four elliptic equations, and you even add another equation for the labs. And you, these equations are derived based on requirement that the time derivative of various quantities should be small. Um, they are independent of having conformal flatness. And so the trick to go to spins bigger than 0.9 is to use a metric that is a superposition of two spinning Kerr metrics as your conformal metric, and then solve the five equations. You can't solve a single equation anymore because the, uh, the assumptions for puncture data are unsatisfied anymore. 
So you just solve all five equations with a good choice for the conformal metric, and you can get up to spins of something like 0 0.9995. This plot here, the second axis, the y-axis, indicates why this is important. It plots the rotational energy of a black hole uh, as a fraction of the maximal rotational energy of an extremal curved black hole. Of course, with spin of one, this quantity is going to be one. But even at 0.9, the maximum of puncture data, this is only 0.6. So bottom line is uh, black holes with spins of 0.9, if you look at, at quantities like rotational energy, they are still very, very far away from being extremal. So one needs to do better. Um, Uh, moving on uh, to, to the new codes, uh, the idea is, as I said, discontinuous Galerkin. Uh, one little example of, of how this actually works in practice, this is a, of the new elliptic solver that uh, students of mine and myself are developing. This is a test problem where we have a singularity sitting in the middle, a C4 singularity. And what's not shown here in this rather complicated figure up here is the solution in the height of the surface. In the middle, it's only c to the fourth, so it, it has an r to the fourth behavior that is not smooth at the origin. And what's shown up here in the color coding is the polynomial degree of the discontinuous elements. It's high, six and seven far away from the singularity. And in the middle, it drops down to four. Whereas the lower panel, uh, shows the refinement level, how often the original big domain was cut into halves. Um, out here, where nothing is happening, the elements are large. H equal three corresponds to a size of, of two to the minus three times the total grid size. Whereas as you go towards the center, the domains become smaller and smaller. H refinement has cut uh, the elements into smaller pieces. Uh, with the highest resolution near the singularity. And if one balances polynomial refinement and H refinement appropriately, it turns out one can still recover exponential convergence in the number of degrees of freedom, despite having the uh, singularity in the problem. Uh, these are so far little test problems. Um, just showing that things actually work on test problems and the generalization to actual black holes is currently underway. Another thing we did just to try uh, the automatic mesh refinement is here's puncture data with three black holes um, where we were just starting out the code with a uniform mesh without telling it where the punctures are and adaptive mesh refinement uh, nicely found and isolated the punctures, the three of them and refined appropriately. And here was an attempt, or here's a solution for a constant density star that has a meta discontinuity at the surface and the adaptive mesh refinement uh, zooms in on the surface, it uses H refinement there, whereas outside and inside it uses bigger elements at a higher expansion order. So all of this seems to be used, uh, working quite fine, and work is underway to do initial data with full discontinuous AMR. Um, the recap of the Einstein evolution equations in harmonic form, we want to solve Einstein equations, it's the wave operator plus the nasty Christoffel terms. The nasty Christoffel terms are related to gauge conditions because they depend on coordinates, and so plugging, assuming the gauge condition to be satisfied, you can remove the Christoffel terms and replace them by H terms, which are nice. But uh, then it turns out if you evolve, your actual coordinates deviate from the ones you specified. The H differs from the box X and the constraint damping term serves to keep the constraint um, uh, controlled. Um, also already mentioned yesterday uh, that we can rewrite everything as a first order system. 
you get an eigenvalue problem and the boundary conditions are needed on the fields that have exactly negative velocities. Boundary conditions are needed exactly on the fields with negative velocities. And I see I have another question about grid structure. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I, I can actually come at the end, but I just wanted to understand why this particular grid structure that you have is, say, uh, it's, it's, say it's different from uh, a llama multi-patch multi grid structure. So, like, what is the advantage of breaking away from the spherical grid structure um, when you need a finer grid? Uh, that I, 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 at least I couldn't follow. Okay, so the llama, okay, so, so there's, a, there's a few different aspects here. Um, I don't have a good image for that, but basically, okay, so you used a few different terms. Let's, let's get rid of the llama grid structure first. Uh, the llama multi-patch idea is another idea that has the same advantages as we out here. That you can deal with the radial dimension without having to increase resolution in the, uh, in the angular directions. Um, we do it by using spherical shells with fixed L resolution and then whatever R resolution is necessary. Llama multi-patch, um, which we also had in spec even before, but didn't use, um, cuts the spherical domains into six topological cubes and keeps the six cubes in, in angles at same resolution while going outward with whatever radial resolution is needed. So both are devices to push the outer boundary far away. Uh, then Lama in the interior uses box-in-box -box mesh refinement to resolve better near the black holes. In our case, this looks more like this in practice. Let's go to my next slide, where we have deformed cylinders and deformed spherical shells. The deformations are there to avoid overlaps because it turns out overlaps lead to numerical instabilities that make the code blow up in, in uncontrolled ways. And we also deform the grids further in order to have our excision boundaries um, adjust to the apparent horizons. The idea of excision is indicated here. So black is the apparent horizon at which point light cones have been turning over to the interior. And red is our actual excision boundary slightly inside the horizon. The light cones have already completely turned over. All the information propagation is into the interior of the black hole. And we can put an artificial boundary here that doesn't need boundary conditions. And that way uh, we avoid doing the interior of the black holes in the singularity completely. However, this relies on two aspects. Number one, all information propagation is within the light cone. This is true for general harmonic. It is not true for PSSN. PSSN gauge conditions have coordinate speeds bigger than the speed of light. Number two, even if you have all information propagating inside the light cone, you still need to be very careful in how you're moving your inner boundaries. They need to move continuously in space time along and near the horizon. The reason for this is given this left image here where I'm indicating what would happen if you keep the inner boundaries fixed for a period of time while the horizon is moving and then you're jumping over and you are having the horizon fixed, the inner boundary fixed again, and then you're just continuously moving again. What can happen then is, is indicated at this point here, where you have a light cone that is nicely inside the horizon. Uh, the outgoing light ray is, is still only tension to the horizon. However, because the boundary is not moving with the horizon, 
the boundary is actually inside the light cone and is a time-like boundary and would need boundary conditions. Whereas if you're moving smoothly along like here, um, uh, the boundary, the light cone is always on one side of the excision boundary line of this dashed curve here. And uh, uh, black hole excision actually works without needing boundary conditions. So the, the concept is easy, the implementation is hard because black hole horizons are nastily distorted near, near merger. And so you not only have to track along the horizons as they orbit around, you also have to deform the grid and your inner boundary to adjust to the often quite interesting looking shapes of the horizon. Uh, thanks. The outer boundary, uh, similarly, is made easier and more precise by the presence of the characteristic modes and the characteristic speeds. I haven't written it down on, on slides, but it turns out you can also, so you have a set of incoming characteristic velocities. So a set of uh, fields on which you need to supply boundary conditions at the outer boundary. It turns out those characteristic fields can be decomposed into three different types of fields. And this was done by work by Lee Lindblom. I had absolutely nothing to do with that. This is cool work. Um, number one are the actual physical degree of freedom that you have two incoming modes that correspond to incoming gravitational waves, uh, Newman Penrose scale up size zero. Number two, you have four incoming modes that correspond to gauge conditions. Number three, you have more incoming modes uh, that can be related to constraints, to traveling constraint violations. And uh, non-zero values of these last set of incoming modes would correspond to incoming constraint violations. And by the decomposition characteristic fields and the association of different combinations of fields with constraints, coordinates, and physics, one can actually make very good educated guesses and choices for what to do. In particular, one can choose all these boundary conditions such that they are constraint preserving, that no constraint violations enter the computational domain and such that they minimize any type of reflections of outgoing gravitational waves uh, at the outer boundary as well. And all this has been, is implemented in spec as, as the only code that does this. Here's one example of just testing the outer boundary conditions. Uh, this is a set of numerical relativity simulations of unequal masses, mass ratio two through six, uh, run at three different outer boundary radii. And what you're seeing here as the, the dash curve is the difference in gravitational wave phase between small and medium outer boundary radius. That's 0.01 radius, radians quite small and, and good. But if we now go between our normal radius and the larger radius, uh, you see this deviation becomes even less and is virtually zero all the way just to merger, where it goes up and down to, to plus minus 0.02. And the same feature that the further out you move the outer boundary, the less impact it has. It's only true for the other simulations here. And then putting everything together, um, the most important output and the most fun output are good looking movies, uh, like this one I did for the first uh, gravitational wave detection. I showed the movie yesterday without the black hole horizons. This time they are here. The horizons are ever so slightly color coded and what's color coded is the northern hemisphere. So if you watch the, the blue black hole horizon and the blue sphere coming in and out of uh, visibility, this actually shows you the black hole spin precession on, on the red black hole. Uh, ultimately, uh, now you're also seeing the orbital plane precession and now the red black hole spin has precessed completely out of sight, pointing away from us. Uh, the movie stops at merger. When the comet horizon forms, you see the three apparent horizons for a short instant in time. 
and then it goes into the wing down phase. Uh, the, the big thing ab about all these simulations is, of course, making sure they are correct. Here's one of the early convergence tests we did in spec. Uh, this is for equal mass non-spinning. Um, if we start at low resolution with about 43 cubed uh, grid points, we get an, a phase error of about one radian, and the code actually crashes before merger. If we increase resolution, we only need to go up a factor 1.5 in each dimension, the 62 cubed. Uh, the errors go down by about a factor of 100 with overall facing error of about 0.1 radian. And uh, the, the two features that come in here that make this possible is the rapid convergence to two spectral methods, but also the trick that we have a moving grid that ro rotates around with the black holes and thus avoids having uh, to add vect to move the, the black holes through a computational grid. One of the things we already did very early on with our already much longer simulations than what other groups had, because this, the high accuracy and the low computational cost allowed us to do much longer simulations than the finite difference groups. Uh, one thing we already did very early on were comparisons to post-Newtonian theory. So this is uh, the comparison for equal mass, no spin. About 10 orbits before merger, we align post-Newtonian with map relativity simulations. And we then compare the phase difference between post-Newtonian and NR as we get close to merger to the, towards the right, and as we go away from merger towards the left. And at Low post-Newtonian order, you see these curves diverging left and right. Uh, towards merger is clear, you expect deviations. Towards the left, this indicates that 10 orbits before merger, second order post-Newtonian uh, just isn't accurate enough on the level of the comparison. If, you, if I now increase the post-Newtonian order here, you see that everything is moving closer together. Post-Newtonian uh, is convergent as it should be. And at the 3.5 pn order, towards earlier times, there's virtually no difference anymore. And towards late times, still deviations show up. Um, the different curves here are different so-called Taylor post-Newtonian approximants that differ in how the energy balance equation is precisely implemented. And as you can see, if you pick the right one, or if you pick one of them, the green one here, everything seems to be looking excessively nice, uh, virtually all the way to one orb cycle before merger, and there aren't virtually any phase differences at, uh, at all. And so one could be tempted to say, hey, post-Newtonian works well until one cycle before merger. Unfortunately, uh, the level of agreement or disagreement depends which post-Newtonian approximate you use. If you use a different one, you, you see much bigger defacings. And what happens is uh, that there are always post-Newtonian truncation errors. And sometimes truncation errors coming from different parts of the calculation just happen to cancel each other, but usually they don't. Unfortunately, there's no a priori knowledge when this happens and where which post-Newtonian approximate might be best. And even worse, uh, the case I just showed to you is the best possible case. Uh, Post-Newtonian accuracy goes down uh, whenever the black holes have unequal masses, whenever you have spins, whenever you have eccentricity. So this is, this is just a, a lower bound of how good one could in principle be. Here, for instance, is a, is, is a plot showing as a function of mass ratio how good or how bad different post-Newtonian approximates are. At equal mass, the errors can be quite small. However, as you go up in mass ratios, the errors can increase remarkably quickly. And one thing that really helps there is, is EOB and the resummation of, of the post-Newtonian series in EOB to uh, tame this quick uh, deterioration of post-Newtonian.
I'm a little bit confused here by where all these lines are coming from on my slides. So let's try and see if I can make them disappear and reappear in some funny way. I don't really know where they are from. I suspect I have somehow activated um, I have somehow activated a, a drawing feature in Zoom and now don't know how to get rid of it again. So in, in terms of most extreme simulations that have been done so far, um, the biggest spin currently published is 0.994. It might be having come up to 0.998. I think it's 0.998 now in our latest SXX catalog. The biggest mass ratio that's actually usable for LIGO and gravitational waves is a mass ratio 18 run by Sasha Husa and company. Uh, the longest simulation is uh, by Bela Selaci and the SXX collaboration, where we did a run that lasted 170 orbits, 350 gravitational wave cycles. And probably the most extreme cases in terms of combining eccentricity, precession, and high mass ratios were done by Adam Lewis and, and collaborators a few years ago. I pointed out earlier that different post-Newtonian, uh, different macro-relativity codes agree. Here's a slide that just shows a few of these comparisons. Um, the very first comparison against different numerical relativity codes uh, was for the equal mass non-spinning case, where this plot actually shows several different waveforms. They are all within the same line thickness. Uh, here's a comparison that was done for the first gravitational wave event uh, between the Rochester group and uh, SXX. Uh, the top panel shows the two numerical relativity waveforms. You can just barely pick up a little bit of, of color aliasing near the merger that indicates the differences. And down here is the difference between them, which is as good a factor of 10 or 100 better than what you would need for analyzing the LIGO events. So this was an important cross check, both that numerical relativity is right and that the waveform templates that were used for the first event are accurate enough. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll skip, skip the stuff about precession. And um, uh, move on with a slide highlighting uh, the somewhat older eccentric and processing binary black hole simulations done by Adam Lewis and Aaron Zimmerman and myself. The goal here was to investigate resonances because the in-out motion, omega r, of generic orbits and the up-down motion given by omega theta of generic orbits. It is known that at extreme mass ratios, these resonances between these two frequencies have a strong impact on the gravitational wave phase. And so what our goal was to see whether at mass ratios one can access numerical relativity uh, whether we can find the resonances and see any impact of them. It sounds simple, but it actually was remarkably difficult to define the frequency omega theta in a full numerical relativity simulation. So it took a tremendous effort to make these seem simply looking plots of uh, resonant phases that are orbiting far away from resonance and then they are constant within the resonant, reson, resonance, and then they, they oscillate again. So we could identify, say, a four to five resonance or a three to four resonance, and we could plot the corresponding lisa Shu diagrams, which look quite nice, uh, thinking that they're coming from full macro relativity. Um, so, so, Harald, so you're, you're looking for a linear phase in this range. What is the sign of a resonance? Like a constant frequency, right? Sorry, say again. What exactly is the sign of a resonance in this picture that you're looking for? 
And the sign of the, like the, the sign signature, of, signature of the resonance. Yeah, the signature of the resonance is that you have a, an integer number of in-out cycles for a different integer number of up-down oscillation periods. I see. And if you turn this into Lissachew figures, it would mean that the Lissachew figure would close after that number of cycles and would repeat itself. And if that happens, the usual averaging theorems, the assumptions that are made uh, uh, for gravitational wave emission uh, are no longer valid and you have extra resonant terms that come into the gravitational wave fluxes that change the in-spiral behavior. I see, thanks. Um, we could identify the resonances. Unfortunately, at mass ratio seven, the black hole spiral instilled so quickly that they spent only one resonance cycle in resonance and we could not discern any impact of resonances on the data. It would be great to repeat this at higher mass ratio, but uh, the effects go like square root of mass ratio. So if you just want to double the, the impact, you need to go to four times higher mass ratio. You need to go from seven to 28. And why this is difficult, I'll try to uh, describe later on. I thought it's always good to have another nice movie somewhere throughout the talk. Um, so this is an, an image of a star field actually of the Milky Way. And as it normally looks, and as it would look like with, uh, if you put a binary black hole in front of it. So this particular star I'm highlighting here is now visible at a different location because the uh, light coming from that star to us is now bent around the two black holes uh, on its way to Earth. Of course, there's also different ways how you can reach us from the light from that star. You can go the opposite way around the two black holes. And so on the other side, you have a separate image. You can also go through the middle. And so you have here a third image of the same star. And I guess you could also go really crazy paths around the one black hole behind the other black hole and then to Earth. And if such an image were to exist and be found, it would be roughly here at this, this blue circle. The first three images of the star I could find, the fourth one I couldn't, but this is kind of what's going on in, in this particular movie, which you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have seen, and where the two black holes are orbiting about each other and are visible through actual ray tracing for the space-time volume of the dynamic space-time. And Again, two black holes orbiting and merging, which gets us to which gets us to uh, gravitational waves and the four or five or six gravitational wave detectors we now have worldwide, including the one in India that is, is also coming along and is slowly turning into reality. The waveforms are important for, for LIGO in order to do matched filtering, to find events, to do parameter estimation, to do tests of general relativity, where one compares the prediction of GR with the actual measurements, and also for validation. So this is another consistency check that was done for the first detection, where a numerical relativity waveform I think the one I showed you earlier in, in the cross comparison between SXX and RIT was injected into LIGO data and analyzed by LIGO methods to make sure that say the mass recoveries are as expected and are well centered on the actual event on the, that was injected into the data. And uh, with this one validates both the waveform models being used as well as the entire analysis pipelines. I've already talked about this one here and these different regions of validity for the different methods are then combined into waveform models by using analytic results early on, numerical relativity for the ring down in spiral ring merger, and then in the ring down analytic and numerical relativity combined. Uh, 
probably most of you are aware that there's two models, two primary models, wafer models in use by LIGO these days. The effective on body um, models, uh, primarily driven by Alessandro Bonanno and, and a large number of collaborators. And the phenomenological wafer models early on developed by, by PR chief and, and uh, collaborators, and then later on taken over by the Cardiff and the Palma groups. Uh, both models basically use it with the same way, in that one starts with a more or less smart representation of how the waveforms look like. We can either put in a lot of theory like an effective one body, or somewhat less theory like in phenomenological. And then you add a variety of fitting parameters to make uh, uh, the model waveforms flexible enough to agree with the actual numerical resolutions, numerical simulations where we have them. And then you fit these parameters against numerical relativity simulations. And this works astonishingly well um, as indicated here by just two examples, a, a processing uh, uh, mass ratio five simulation from, uh, for EOBs, and here mass ratio eight aligned spin simulations for the phenom models. In either case, both an R and, and, and the model is shown, and in either case, it's essentially no longer possible to distinguish differences if you're just plotting the waveforms themselves. One big impact here, importance for me, is that it requires you to have the numerical simulations in order to, to calibrate the models against. And so over the last 10 years or so, parameter space exploration, computing ever longer and ever better numerical relativity waveform has been a big issue. In 2009, the Ninja project collected 20 simulations worldwide, which is all that was available back then. Um, but very quickly, the numbers shoot up. Uh, in 2013, uh, our collaboration had the then biggest catalog with the longest waveforms, about 170 waveforms. It was still good enough to plot the waveforms because there were still few enough. Um, we continued with a second catalog in, in 2015 with aligned spin waveforms. And all these extra waveforms are continuously being used to improve the analytical models. For instance, uh, an earlier version of the EOB model got turned into a later model of the EOB model, and the mismatch error went down from about 0.1 for the worst cases, a factor of 10 to 0.01 for the worst cases. And it has improved further since. Um, as have the size of the waveform catalogs, uh, for SXX, our latest waveform catalog was published last year and also released last year. So all these waveforms are publicly available if you want to do analysis with them. And now we are nearly two th over 2,000 simulations and it's just too many to plot waveforms anymore. So what one resorts to are parameter space plots, like here the mass ratio coverage and the chi effective coverage of the simulations as black dots overlaid with the actual first three gravitational wave event contours. So coverage is quite good up to mass ratio of four and beyond four, beyond six roughly, it becomes a lot less uh, crowded. Um, the simulations also have become increasingly longer. In the first simulation catalog, we had 20 or 30 cycles. Now the median is more like 50 to 60 cycles, and we have some that go all the way up to 300 or 350 cycles. This is the one mass ratio seven simulation I, I already had on an earlier case. So far, all of it is focused on very low eccentricities, the case that most relevant to LIGO, uh, but we are looking more and more into eccentric systems as well. And SPEC is not the only uh, group doing this. There's, of course, also other groups around Georgia Tech, uh, Rochester, NCSA, where especially NCSA has now started to do eccentric simulations. So these simulations, all of here are eccentric. 
having that many simulations, one can actually also do uh, build numerical analytic waveform models directly from the numerics itself using uh, the techniques of the so-called surrogate waveform modeling. It's a fairly complicated process, quite ingenious. Um, the cool, uh, the, the fe major uh, headline features are that you need about a thousand or so macro relativity simulations, which we now have. Once you have them, you can nearly automatically construct a model that covers all the parameter space of your waveforms. And it's quite easy to get the model accuracy to be as good as the numerical relativity accuracy. If you want details about this, I very strongly recommend that you invite Vijay Varma to give you a, a talk about this, either in person or remotely. And here's just one example of how well this works. This time around, I'm plotting three waveforms. Uh, this is a mass ratio eight processing system. Uh, the red and the black is numerical relativity and then surrogate waveform model, which works remarkably well all the way up to merger and ring down with all the extra little feature. Whereas the EOB waveform in this case has a very slight defacing towards the merger. So the, when they work, the surrogates are even more accurate than the EOB waveforms. Um, the big feature in the last one or two years of the waveform modeling was to also use the higher modes of numerical relativity and use them to construct higher mode waveform models that are, go beyond the quadrupolar 2 2 waveform mode. Um, as of the LIGO 01 02 events, it didn't really matter much. The, the biggest impact one could discern was for 1708 17 the system with the highest masses observed by them. And if one was to reanalyze the system with higher mode waveform models, one could get a much more pronounced measurement of the mass ratio around two, but still some supported equal masses, whereas the, the uh, beforehand available two two mode only waveform models gave you a, a much less well measured mass ratio. Um, this has become much more impressive more lately with the latest announced gravitational wave from 1904-12, which is the first event published that has a clearly non-equal mass uh, black hole where the mass ratio is about uh, 0.25 to 0.3. Especially the, um, what you can see now is that if, I'm, if you're looking down here, this is where the most pronounced uh, improvement is being made. Uh, the higher multipoles do indeed change how well you can measure the, the orbital inclination of the binary because the emission pattern of the higher multipole radiation is different from the emission pattern of the 2-2 multipole. And if you were to analyze the system only with two two-way for modes indicated here as dominant multipole, you will get the usual degeneracy between inclination and distance. However, if you use a line spin eight higher multiple waveform models, you're already breaking this degeneracy and you're getting this dashed curve. And if you also put precession in, you can improve uh, the degeneracy even better and measure the inclination and the distance uh, to better uh, precision than before. Uh, this particular case is also right at the edge of how well the different waveform models agree with each other. So here, the processing phenomenological model with higher modes and the processing EOB model with higher modes give still fairly consistent results, but some tension is, is visible here. And this comes about because the processing HM model is actually the last generation one, the mass ratio, uh, the PV3 HM. Uh, that does not yet have the amplitudes of the higher modes fitted to NR, but just uses the post Newtonian amplitudes. So I would in increase, I would expect that the agreement between phenomena and, and EOB models is going to increase again further in the, in the future. And yes, I agree with the question asked in the chat window, the surrogate model 
is also in some sense a phenomenological wafer model. Well, in some sense, all of them are phenomenological in the sense that somewhere along the construction, you stare at actual numerical relativity simulations, and you then pick three functions to match the behavior in the numerical relativity simulations. Um, but also the word phenomenological wafer model in some sense has been taken, it's a generic term, but in some sense it has been taken over as the, the selling word, the, the, brand, uh, the branding word for one of the waveform families developed uh, in the last 10 years. Okay, um, I have Outlook and some of them I want to show, others I can just go over. You know that gravitational wave detectors are continuing to run. You know that future detectors like the Einstein telescope are being developed uh, that make higher, more accurate uh, measurements at high frequencies. I expect you also know that we have different types of black holes, like supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. And as galaxies merge with each other, the supermassive black holes in the centers are merging with each other. Uh, the LISA space mission is looking for gravitational waves from these supermassive black holes at lower frequencies. So a lot more activity is going on. Uh, there's also pulsar timing at yet lower frequencies. And fundamentally, what is needed is that these future detectors are more accurate. So they're going to see louder events, which are going to need more accurate waveforms. Here's a study by Mike Pura and, and, and Carl Haster, uh, basically saying that currently in O1 and even at uh, Hanford uh, LIGO, Virgo, CACRA design sensitivity, the systematic errors are still uh, small and uh, that the waveform models are good enough. But as you go to higher, as you go into the future with higher precision measurements, uh, the waveform accuracy you need, the waveform errors you can tolerate, become ever smaller um, for these higher signal to noise ratio events. And so in the term of, in the times of Einstein telescope, uh, we need to have the whole waveform modeling pipeline to be accurate at 10 to the minus five. Uh, this already sometimes works for the numerical relativity waveforms for the few cycles of numerical relativity we have, but it also needs to work for more cycles in order to get the connection to the inspirable waveforms more, more precisely. And if you look at the precision of the current analytical waveform models, like here the phenomenon models, phenomenon PV2 actually, an old one, um, there is several orders of magnitude of improvement that is necessary in order to exploit Einstein telescope and similar fully. Um, on the numerical relativity side, there are a lot of efforts on going to improve waveforms further. Um, uh, SPEC now by default does also center of mass correction, which avoids certain mode mixing from the 2-2 mode into higher order modes leading to uh, uh, artificial features in the higher order modes. We have reworked our spin definitions and can now reproduce uh, post newtonian spin notation features a lot more accurately. And uh, SPEC is planning to switch over to Cauchy characteristic extraction in the near, in the near future so that waveforms aren't extracted at some finite radius anymore, but waveforms can be measured directly at future non-infinity avoiding uh, gauge effects in the waveform extraction. So there are very credible ways underway of doing better what we already do, but one big difficulty moving forward is the expansion of parameter space. Um, if you have you looked at the slide from earlier, you might notice that all the records are already quite a few years old, 15, 15, 15, 17. And the reason is that um, while it is easy to improve the sampling of the easy region of para parameter space, it is remarkably difficult to push into different regions of parameter space, where the hard regions of parameter space are uh, 
any combination of high mass ratio, high spins, or really long simulations. And the basic issue is the ball clock time of these simulations, that the number of steps in a simulation goes up like the mass ratio squared. Uh, one mass ratio comes from the current limit, that the more smaller the little black hole gets, the smaller time steps you must take. Another power of Q comes from the physics that with higher mass ratios, the system does more orbits of in spiral per frequency interval. And the number of time steps and the cost also goes up with the initial frequency of your simulation. The nasty thing is that all these, these, these are quite large powers that are combining and conspiring to make things really hard. For instance, you want to go a factor of two in mass ratio, gives you a factor of four here. You want to get a factor of two in low frequency, gives you a factor of two to the eight thirds, which is a factor of seven. And you want higher accuracy for the future detectors. And very quickly, you have a factor of 100 increase in wall time with the current code. The simulations I showed you run about a month. And so a factor 100 increase in wall time would turn this into 10 years. It's just not practical. And this is one of the reasons why we are working on the discontinuous lurking code to make life better. Um, to make life even worse, uh, Lisa is going to see a lot more diverse events as well. There are the massive binary black holes, intermediate mass black holes, and really large mass ratio systems. So as the mass ratio goes up, also the eccentricity can become ever more extreme. And today's wafer models that are good for equal mass non-spin, uh, sorry, good for non, for circular orbits and moderate mass ratios, uh, just aren't yet up to covering everything that we are going to need for LISA. So numerical relativity will have to improve a lot and um, uh, the wafer modeling will have to improve a lot. But since I'm really running late, I'm just showing a few highlights uh, the recent highlights of work in progress about eccentricity and about the question whether there's a gap at intermediate mass ratio where neither numerical relativity can reach nor the small mass ratio perturbation theory can reach. So uh, recent results from, from the AI are these new simulations of extremely eccentric simulations with very, very many cycles. Um, so we're starting with initial declaration of 60 uh, uh, at initial eccentricities of about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, uh, that order of magnitude. And we can uh, easily follow these simulations through tens of radial uh, oscillations until they eventually merge after uh, the simulation comes from the 30,000 M in spiral. And as you watch the system in spiral and, and orbit, you notice that, uh, notice the circularization, the circularizing effect of the gravitational waves that eccentricity is diminished during the spiral. These are so far prototype simulations. They work and we are now uh, embarking on more uh, systematic studies of these types of systems. I guess I'm, I'm fast forwarding a few orbits here uh, so you can see the merger as well. The difficulty with these really long simulations is that the movies get difficult to show. We're doing this for equal masses here. Um, we've also started the first unequal mass simulations. And um, the interesting feature for coming back to this mass ratio gap thing is that the interesting feature is that the waveforms, the in spirals turn ever longer, that the number of orbits grows like the proportional to the mass ratio. Um, here's a simulation by Steve Dreskov of geodesics showing you that sometimes you get this resonant features where all the, all the frequencies are in tune and the usual orbit averaging doesn't work anymore when computing the in spiral. Those were the features you were trying to assess with the um, numerical relativity simulations at mass ratio seven. 
the reason I'm re-highlighting re them here is to show you the structure of the small mass ratio expansion. There's a leading order term that goes like uh, 1 over nu, the number of cycles goes up. There's a contribution phi 1 that adds to the phase a number of cycles proportional to unity, independent of the mass ratio. And then there are correction terms proportional to nu. The difficulty in the small mass, mass ratio approximation is that there aren't enough known results, that even phi 1 isn't completely known as of today, not even for circular orbits. And in some recent work by um, Martin, Martin van der Meet and myself, we have begun analyzing numerical relativity waveforms and we have been trying to extract the phi 0, phi 1 and phi 2 orbital facing functions that are the primary target of, of the small mass ratio uh, analytical work directly from numerical relativity. And so the right hand side plot here uh, shows as a function of frequency uh, what we could extract from the numerical simulations themselves. In particular, we have in black, in blue here, the leading order uh, perturbative uh, gravitational self force result, the phi zero term. And that agrees within the line thickness with the uh, self force calculations. So all is well. We could also extract fairly, fairly accurately the phi one function, which is shown here. Uh, all of this is for circular orbits, no spin. And we can thus compute for the first time the phi 1 function for the frequency range that is covered by the numerical simulation. And we can also get hints on the phi 2 functions, which we can um, estimate to be quite small of only a few radians at best during the spiral. And so it turns out if you combine these results, our knowledge of phi 1 and the fact that phi 2 is quite small, one can make an estimate of how good one can cover the quasi-circular no-spin parameter plane with the various uh, approximations. At comparable masses, here on the x-axis is the mass ratio, the symmetric mass ratio. At comparable masses, we have numerical relativity that is good at high frequencies going down to a frequency, whatever the initial frequency of the numerical relativity simulations is. So here's a region of, of the plane that can be covered by numerical relativity. On the opposite end, up here in the top left corner are the post-Newtonian results. And we are color coding the, the region of, of the parameter plane that can be covered with post-Newtonian if you're happy to tolerate a certain uh, post-Newtonian phasing error, pi 16, pi over 8, pi over 4, the more error you're happy to tolerate, the bigger part of the parameter plane you can cover. And even with pi over 4, you see here there's still a, a certain gap in frequency, even at equal masses, between post-Newtonian and numerical relativity. This gap widens as you go to higher mass ratios. Uh, where both post-Newtonian becomes less accurate and where the numerical relativity simulations can't cover quite as high frequencies as they can for equal masses. However, the new result that we have is that the small mass ratio calculation, once you know phi 1 everywhere from the actual analytic calculations that are expected to be computed in a few years, that the small mass ratio calculation, because phi 2 is so small, is actually remarkably accurate, even at remarkably large mass ratios. And it turns out that the small mass ratio calculation fits in, fills in nicely all the gap that is left between numerical relativity and post-Newtonian. And so for equal mass, no spin, sorry, for no spins quasi-circular, at all mass ratios, it seems like there is no mass ratio gap that the three methods combined can cover all the different parts of parameter space. Of course, how this is going to hold up for generic cases is yet to be seen. Um, I expect that as before, that once you turn on spins, everything gets worse 
And once you turn on eccentricity, everything gets worse. So this is a very encouraging first step, but uh, a lot of more work is needed to either confirm this uh, for more generic systems or to uh, then fill in any gaps that show up for more generic systems. And here I'm going to close and I'm also putting up one more plot of a hyperbolic capture simulation just because I have another nice movie here uh, with my summary slides. Gravitational waves are great, numerical relativity is important and has been important and is going to be important in the future and there's a lot of continued intense efforts needed to keep up with the instruments both in numerical relativity and in the subsequent waveform modeling. Thank you very much and I apologize yet again for running so awfully over time. Thank you very much, Harold, for this very nice summary of, of this uh, research in the whole field. Let me inaugurate the question session by asking one question. So if, can you go back to your um, work with uh, Vandermeer, this uh, parameter space plot? Yeah, this one. So um, why isn't this uh, extreme mass ratio uh, to the, the, the perturbative calculation does not cover all frequencies, at least in the extreme mass ratio limit? Only that you have not plotted it that direction? Um, you mean down here? Yeah, yeah, right. This yeah. corner. Um, so the, the extreme mass ratio calculation is picking up a, a continuous secular defacing in the waveform relative to the actual GR result that comes from the higher order terms. And now you could choose where you want to anchor this. You could anchor it at ISCO and then ask from ISCO going backward, how far back could you go uh, until you have accumulated so much defacing that the waveforms become unreliable? Or you could anchor it elsewhere in the frequency range. What we have chosen for this plot is we have chosen to, to shift the regime shown here that's covered by small mass ratio such that it covers the largest possible range in frequencies. Oh, I see. Okay, thanks. Similarly, we have chosen to anchor post-Newtonian at frequency zero at very, very large separation. And so these post-Newtonian contours correspond to if you're starting at very, very, very early times, uh, up to what frequency could you go until you have accumulated a phase difference of say pi over four. Yes. Those are choices. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, the floor is open for uh, questions on based on this lecture as well as the entire course. So there was one question by uh, Fred Susawa uh, about the surrogate waveform models. Uh, the question is, is surrogate waveform a, a phenomenological model? In, in principle, yes. It, it basically boils down to nomenclature. Um, that The word phenomenological basically means uh, you stare at the answer. And then based on staring at the answer, you um, choose a, a good looking functional form to represent the answer. And in some sense, all wafer models do this by now. Uh, most obviously in the ones that are actually called phenomenological waveform models, because there are in some parts of, of, of frequency space, you're just putting in literally a Taylor expansion with unknown uh, a power series with unknown coefficients and you're just fixing these coefficients. Um, the surrogate in some sense would also fall under this heading it, it literally stares at a thousand relativity simulations and tries to distill down information from them as much as it can. But also the EOB waveform model falls under this heading 
in that in EOB during the, the late inspire and lunch phase, um, one also looks very carefully at the numerical relativity results and the differences to the simpler versions of EOB, and then puts in target built new terms to match this functional shape there. Okay, there is one question about the BOB model, which is not entirely related, and there is another one about light cones. Uh, so, so the, the, the BOB model is a is basically the notion that you can take uh, black hole perturbation theory and push it backwards remarkably far while into the in spiral phase while still having remarkably accurate looking answers. Um, the idea I think is quite elegant and quite nicely. However, I don't see any way of validating it without comparison to numerical relativity simulations. And that's the same feature also with post-Newtonian and, and effective on body methods. Uh, the underlying idea is really, really nicely. Uh, the results look very sensible, um, but ultimately you only trust the late EOB inspirer and the merger because it agrees with numerical relativity the same is true for the BOB model. You only trust its late in spiral prediction because it happens to agree with numerical relativity. And at that point, because it's, it's very difficult to discern anymore um, who came first and, and what is cause and what is uh, consequence. Um, for instance, the BOB model was developed after numerical relativity simulations were already available. And I think if it hadn't fit numerical relativity, I'm, I'm not sure the paper would, would ever have been published to begin with. So in principle, it doesn't use numerical relativity, but in, in practice, I think implicitly it does. And the same is true for the EOB waveform development in the last few years. There are new uh, ways of refactoring uh, amplitudes and gravitational waves and, and various pieces of it. Um, there are very good uh, uh, theoretical reasons why you should be doing those uh, uh, amplitude refactoring, for instance. And then the EUP papers go on and show that, that it also improves the agreement with numerical relativity. And again, it's, it's, it's difficult to discern of whether the model is better because the, the analytical results are better or whether the analytical results are better because uh, those that would have not agreed with numerical relativity would not have been pursued. Um, so POP is a nice idea. I'm, I'm quite impressed how well it works, but it's, it's the validation issue that I, I cannot address uh, uh, independently of, of other pieces in the puzzle. Um, light cones for apparent horizon and event horizons. So the apparent horizons are defined as marginally trapped surfaces so that the outgoing light front instantaneously stays at the same, has, covers the same surface area. And it turns out apparent horizons are allowed to move superluminally. In, in fact, the space-time uh, surface traced out by apparent horizon is generically space-like. So at the apparent horizon, instantaneously uh, the null geodesics don't have expansion. So this would be a nice light cone. However, the apparent horizon itself can move superluminally outward and could therefore lead to extra information that is initially outside the apparent horizon being trapped inside the apparent horizon.
I'm not sure whether this has helped uh, clarify DVR Geotry's question or whether it has rather more confused. Um, that's a very good question by Pranav. How do you find the matching point between PN and NR? Ideally, you would want to go back as much and taking as much in R cycles, such that whatever uncertainties you have in PN don't matter anymore. Um, in practice, we don't have that luxury because the numerical relativity simulations are so expensive that they can't cover enough cycles. So what's happening is rather more practical. For the phenomenological waveform models, um, you take as many NR cycles as you have, which are still clean enough and, and don't show artifacts that, that appear due to chunk radiation early on. And then you hybridize with the best available post-Newtonian or EOB model. And then you have long waveforms that you then fit against the phenomenological waveform approach. Uh, the important operational feature regarding the question is, you take as much NR as you have. For the EOB waveform models, where the EOB waveforms give you complete waveform models already anyway, so that you take the full EOB waveform model and you fit it against NR in the frequency range available in NR. So the, the operational point here is in the frequency range available. And so in either cases, you basically go as early as you can and you hope that it's good enough. For the EOB models, there are studies that if you take less of NR and, and repeat the fitting, that the EOB model is fairly robust and doesn't change much. For the phenom models, I actually don't know whether such studies exist. Uh, they may or may not exist. I, I, I literally don't know. So the, the way one now validates the procedure at the end of the day is either by the EOB studies where you take less NR to, to do the fit and, sh and show that you get the same answer, or by the select few really long NR waveforms that then still show so far for the simple cases where this has done, been done, that there's no extra big defacing coming in and errors coming in. And also fundamentally by plots like the one I was showing that compare NR, that do the parameter estimation with different, different waveform models and show uh, reasonably good agreement still. And so far we've been always in the, in the regime where for the gravitational waves the universe gives us, uh, waveform models with, uh, constructed with different approaches that also do different matching of the early in spirals uh, give reasonably consistent results. This is the worst, result, worst agreement we have so far. And even that I would expect would be a lot better if the phenom PV2 or the PV3 HM is replaced by the now available phenom XP HM model. Um, so I think we are doing good for the time being, but um, in, in some sense, we are literally uh, writing the wave crest in that the wafer model's improvement is just barely keeping up. And also the NR parameter space coverage is just barely keeping up with the new uh, observations. Oh, and to make a long way, answer even longer, uh, let me warn you that in the future, this nice little argument, hey, the phenomenon, the EOB wafer models agree with each other. So therefore the 
systematic errors are probably irrelevant, that this argument is going to become more difficult in the future. The reason is that Phenom X uses UBV4 in spiral waveforms for the early part of the waveform model. And so if you now have a low mass system where the early part of the waveform is the important one, um, and you find that the Phenom X and the UB agree with each other, well, this basically shows that this could very well be caused by the simple fact that both the Phenom X and the UBV4 just have the same in spiral waveform model that underpins them. But it by itself will no longer be a, a clear uh, measure of how, how accurate either model is because they only use the same model before in that particular case. Thank you, Harold. This is a, I think this is a good, good time to stop the question session. Um, and let me thank uh, Harold for this wonderful summary of this field. Um, thank you very much.